the only way, real way to prevent those cases is by the use of antibiotic as a preventive tool. If you use amoxicillin, penicillin or amoxicillin, you can prevent those cases. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode of the Swine It Canada podcast. I'm Dan Columbus, and I'll be your host for today's episode. And with me today, I have Dr. Marcelo Gottschalk, who is professor and director of the International Reference Laboratory uh, for Strepsuis and Swine Pleuronemonia at the University of Montreal. So welcome to the show, Marcelo. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to the, the conversation today, uh, but just before we get into the, the nitty gritty of what you want to talk about, I think I'll just ask, uh, because many people might not know who you are or what you do, just uh, to give you a little bit uh, history of yourself and, and your journey so far. Yes. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, okay, I'm graduate of... Um, DVM in, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, a long time ago. Then I came here to, uh, to Canada to pursue my um, master and PhD. And uh, I, I then became professor at the University of Montreal and the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, when I arrived here, um, I had a an excellent supervisor who uh, who was Robert Higgins, a very well known bacteriologist here in Canada. And at that moment, uh, in connection with the subject that we are going to talk about, he told me, "You know, Marcelo, uh, I have for you a sideline. That means a subject that is not really very important, uh, because nobody is talking about that." But if you are interested, then you can go ahead and probably be the first to do a lot of things because it's a pathogen that not a lot of people are working on. That pathogen was a streptococcus suis. And I say, okay, that suits perfectly well for me. So I did my PhD in the sideline of his lab. And um, curiously, and I will tell you when it started, but it became a major issue in in swine because presently uh, in in uh, winnet piglets is the first cause of mortality due to a bacterial pathogen and we will talk a little bit about how the antibiotic restrictions uh, collaborate with this type of problem. So it became, I mean, it was a sideline and now is one of the most important pathogens. So I decided to keep working on strep suisse after my PhD. And now it has been 35 years that I have been working with, with this pathogen. So I know it pretty well, despite the fact that there are a lot of things that are not very well known. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and you know what, what happened when everything changed, there are two icons when, when everything changed. This is a pathogen that can be transmitted to humans. And uh, so is it zoonotic. Let's let, let begin with the swine part. I mean, it's a pathogen for swine. It will affect mainly uh, winnet piglet between three and nine weeks of age. They will develop uh, meningitis, septicemia with sudden death, arthritis, a lot of other infections, but these are the most important ones. When transmitted to humans, it will cause also meningitis and, and can produce septic shock with mortality. And I began to work on this pathogen, and in 2005, Something happened in China. What happened in China is all of a sudden it was uh, a serious outbreak of a strep suisse in humans. When I'm talking about serious outbreak that was hundreds of people affected with more than 70% died of a strep suisse. This was completely atypical 
And uh, it was very funny because it was one of my biggest mistakes I've done in my career was when uh, a journalist in the middle of the night, because it was in Asia, I was on vacation in July uh, in, in some part in Quebec, and they called me. It was midnight for me, and they say, "Hey, we have here an, uh, an infection, serious infection with the strep suisse. A lot of people are dying, oh, but a lot of people at the same time. So it's real an outbreak." So I said, "Listen, I have been working on strep suisse. This is." Not something that we see. So I'm not very sure that the strep suisse is the main reason. It should be other things. That was my biggest mistake because it was, in fact, the strep suisse. <laughs> so um, that sentence, um, that, that, that phrase that I, that I pronounce in, uh, with the journalist, uh, in my lab, in my faculty, I mean, Everybody remind me that you were wrong because it was really strep suisse. And, and I was wrong. In fact, it was a strep suisse. It was something that we never saw. It was very virulent, highly virulent strain. And a lot of people were dying. And uh, after that episode, I met the, the director of the CDC, the Center of Disease Control in, in Beijing, in China, they, he contacted me. He uh, he is because I'm still in contact with him. He is a medical doctor, physician, and he he told me, "Listen, we do not know anything about strep suisse. We need your help to see what is happening here." So I sent someone from my lab over there, who uh, who was there for four weeks, studying the strain that caused that disease. So then we realized that it's a very highly virulent strain. That is typically from China. It's a serotype. A serotype is an antigenic um, type of the strep suisse, which is present also here in North America. But this strain was really different and caused a lot of, uh, of, of mortality. People were dying. The first case was um, uh, a swine producer, but a local. He has some pigs in the in, in, in the backyard type of production. So one of the pigs died. He didn't know why the animal died, but in China, they will decide sometimes to eat the animal who died. If it is fresh, they will decide to do that. He, so he opened the pig with his bare hands, and the infection can be transmitted, you know, by uh, cutaneous Pleasure. I mean, it's, you can have some problem in, in your skin, and bacteria can go through 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 that. And the guy died six hours later, when he was. Uh, I mean, he could not arrive to the hospital. He 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 died before arriving to the hospital. It was really a, a septicemic shock. And then we realized that the strain was really virulent. So from from that moment. Many, many people who didn't know strep suisse realized that this infection exists. So a lot of people began to work on that, on that, uh, on that infection. And uh, if you follow the number of papers published, uh, there was, let's say, I don't know, 20 papers per year before 2005, six, and after that, there were probably 100 per year or more, 200 per year. And now there are probably 400 per year because a lot of people began to work on strep suisse. So what, that is one of the reasons why this infection became very popular. Then they realized that people in countries like Thailand and Vietnam, uh, there, are, they were, there were a lot of people dying of strep suisse that they didn't know. So where we I have many collaboration with people from Vietnam, especially from Thailand, and the situation is very different. In that part, in those countries, they will eat some dishes which are prepared with fresh blood. It's like ketchup. You will mm -hmm. take a picture of that. It's like ketchup, but in fact, it's blood. So. And this, uh, this, this type of, um, of dishes 
will infect people through the oral route and they develop serious disease due to strep suey. So there are many, many outbreaks of strep suey in Thailand per year due to that. And uh, so it's a serious problem for humans in Asia. China was different because in China, uh, they do not eat raw pork. All we will be well cooked, but they will be infected handling disease pork or ill pork. So that's a very big part for the human side. But, you know, the, the infection in pigs was always present, but hives and low, sometimes we isolate, sometimes we didn't isolate. But all of a sudden, in Europe, they began to reduce the use of antibiotics. And what, strep suisse is a bacteria that is normally present in tonsils. So when you have a lot of antibiotics in, in the farm, these bacteria are not able to, you know, express themselves and cause disease. But when you take out those kind of antibiotics, then you can have a serious problem. I remember five, six years ago, I was giving a, a talk in, in Spain. So I was a room full of practitioners. So I asked the question, tell me who, who has farm with problem with the strep suisse? And there were probably 80 per people in the room and probably 10 raised their hands. Not a lot. So the next question was, who has farms using permanently amoxicillin in the field? Everybody raised their hand. Two years ago, three years ago, there was an, uh, a new law in Spain that now is forbidden to use amoxicillin in the field. So the cases explode. So now they are contact me, they are contacting me and ask me what happened. Well, we have new strains because we have a lot of cases. And in fact, the strains are the same. The cases are the same. The, the difference mainly that we are not using antibiotics. And we can talk about this later, is that the only way, real way to prevent those cases is by the use of antibiotics as a preventive tool. If you use amoxicillin, penicillin or amoxicillin, you can prevent those cases. When you are not longer uh, able to use those antibiotics, then you will have problems, and that is one of the reasons that now is, is, is probably the main reason of, of disease in this young piglet, because we can talk about this, there is no commercial vaccine available to protect these animals. So the context is very special, because you have a pathogen that, in the absence of antibiotics, affect pigs, and it's extremely difficult to control that without the use of antibiotics. The other point is, it's a normal inhabitant of the tonsils. Not always viral strains, but sometimes even viral strains can be present in the tonsils of animal. And the environment of the animal and co-infection or uh, uh, you know, uh, changes in temperature, everything that surround the animal can induce the disease to appear. So you have other factors to collaborate to the infection, the lack of the use of antibiotics as a preventing tool, and these things together make this infection as, uh, as, as really, really important. What I forgot to mention is, I, I, I kept working on strep suis after my PhD, and I was able to raise what is called the reference laboratory, the International Reference Laboratory for Strep Suisse. So we are lucky because we have access to all types of strains coming around the world because they send us the strain for characterization, 
And so we have human strains and we also have a swine strain. Uh, since as a reference lab, they want us to, uh, to study, more, to perform more deeper studies on those strains. When it comes to purity, performance, and immunity, High D has been helping pigs and producers stand strong for years. As a proven source of pure 25-OH D3 for diet fortification, High D is the fastest and most efficient way to provide pigs with essential vitamin D. One product, seven years on the market, more than 100 research trials, and millions of pigs fed. There's only one High D. Learn more at dsm.com forward slash hy dash D. It's a good good history to see, you know, how this has all come about and why the importance is. Um, I, I am wondering, though, what the situation is in Canada specifically, right? Because, you know, you mentioned in Spain they have this total ban, whereas in Canada it's just growth promotion. But that the the antibiotic use for prevention is still quite high, you know, and in, in, in used in a number of farms. So are we seeing the same thing? What is What is the problem in Canada specifically? It's extremely pertinent, your question, because as you mentioned, we are still able to use those antibiotics as a preventive tool. But I believe it won't be for a long time, because what is present in Europe will arrive, is arriving slowly to, to North America. So here you have Two, in general, two types of farms. There are some farms that are reducing the use of antibiotics. Also, there are farms without antibiotics. And these farms are extremely affected by strep suis. You have other type of, of farm where they can use uh, the antibiotic as a preventive tool. And they are able to keep the infection in relatively low mortality of Two, three percent, which is not very high, but this is due to the use of antibiotics. So I don't know if we can say that we are lucky or not. Perhaps I should say the opposite. But <laughs> but but it is true that the, even though we are using antibiotics, it is documented that strep suis is the most common infection in post-winded piglets in Canada. It's the first one. It's number one in Canada and in USA. So even if we are using antibiotic, we are still having a lot of problems. You can imagine what is going to happen when we will banish the use of some antibiotic, at least as a preventive one. In metaphylaxis, that means the use of antibiotics in the presence of clinical signs, if you go to Europe, in theory, in most countries, is forbidden. In practice, it is done because they have no choice. It is, you know, um, it's a mixture of treatment and, and, uh, and metaphylaxis because there are some animals that are affected, but usually they will treat, you know, all, all, all the barn because they, they, they cannot live with so many clinical cases. But I'm pretty sure that that is going to happen sooner or later here in Canada, but we are still having a lot of problems. Yeah. It, like you said, you know, we know it's probably coming or some, some level of it will come because we've seen it elsewhere. You know, I, a lot, a lot of my work that I do is from the nutrition side of it has been a result of how do we feed for healthier pigs? And I think that, you know, the use of antibiotics in some ways made us lazy because we could ignore a lot of these other things, right? So it's one of these, well, now we're having to learn, well, what do we do, you know, when we don't have that tool in the toolbox anymore, right? So. And you are right. And you know, as a, a person working in nutrition, the, uh, the fact that antibiotics are banished as a preventive measure in Europe a lot of people working in nutrition propose the use of different types of products to reduce the, the infection for the strep suis. Why? Because in humans, it's well demonstrated that the infection can go through the oral route. Mm -hmm. It's really not clear in pigs. It is believed that it's mostly by the respiratory route. But anyway, 
it is true that we can find strep suis in the intestine. So there are a lot of, you know, product that has been proposed for E. coli for reducing diarrhea and to try to uh, to reduce the infection of strep suis. It's really very early to say if these are working or not. In some cases, in the field, in some cases it seems to help a little bit, but it's not necessarily, you know, a, a solution for, for the problem. But now there are many, many people working in nutrition, nutritionists mm-hmm. that are interested in, in the control of strep suis because we can talk later if you wish why we don't have vaccines because we don't have vaccines commercial vaccine for strep suis i mean we can discuss that right now the next thing i was going to ask is based on all of your work you know what are the potential uh tools that we have to deal with this outside of antibiotics but i think it might be a good one because that would be obvious right that we deal with a lot of these with vaccination protocols so we can start with that like why why does that not yeah you you are you are right i mean it makes sense that if you reduce the use of antibiotic is because you give space to uh, room to the to the vaccines strep suis has several problems one of the problem is that there are different serotypes the serotypes are antigenic uh, modification of the same bacterial species so there are 29 different serotypes most of them have been described by by our lab in, in the first place. So it is extremely difficult to have a vaccine that will cover all the serotypes. This is the first problem. But even having a, a vaccine for the most important serotype, it will be already something very useful. Still, we don't have that vaccine. We are working, my lab is working, but many other labs are also working in the development of a, of a vaccine that will be commercial, but still we don't have it. Very difficult to get protection against a strep suis. So what do we use? Well, because there are vaccines that are being used in the field. These are autogenous vaccines. So definition of autogenous vaccine is a vaccine that is produced from an isolate recovered from the farm. So recover the isolate from the farm and an autogenous vaccine company will produce a vaccine to be used in the same farm. These are bacterines. Bacterines mean that are whole bacteria that is killed and then mixed with an adjuvant. So it's a whole bacteria. We have been working the last three, four years in the evaluation of autogenous vaccine in the field to see are uh, either working or not, because it's a controversy. Some people say that they are working relatively well. Others say they are not working at all. So the first thing that we, that we realized is that, you know, when you have a commercial vaccine, the commercial vaccine, let's say, that has been developed in France by a company, once it is produced and you use the same vaccine here in Canada, it will be exactly the same vaccine because it is a commercial company that has validated, homologated the, the vaccine, and it will be the same. When you produce an autogenous vaccine, there are no rules. The only rule is that the vaccine should not induce any lesion, obviously non disease. Mm-hmm. But other than that, there is no rules. Each laboratory will produce the vaccine in a different way, usually confidential way, because they have their own protocols. So they produce the bacterial concentration. They only know the bacterial concentration, how the bacteria has been grown, how it has been inactivated, which type of adjuvant used. So you have a product A produced by one company and a product B produced by another company, and they are completely different. So it is impossible to say this vaccine is, the autogenous vaccine are working because you cannot 
you know, give a general uh, evaluation of products that are completely different one each other. So we have evaluated uh, two, not companies, but vaccines produced by two different companies. And in one case, there was not even induction of antibodies. So the pigs did not see the vaccine at all. No, no production of antibodies at all. In the other way, we observe a good induction of antibodies. So it will depend on the company. And there is a second problem for the use of vaccine or any vaccine, commercial vaccine that will be used in the future. It's a problem for strep suis. I, I mentioned to you that uh, disease occurs in piglets from uh, around four weeks of age until seven, eight weeks of age. This is the moment where the maternal antibodies are going down and they are no longer there. The animals, then they are ill. If you vaccinate sows, is what people like to do because obviously it's, it costs much less money to vaccinate sows than vaccinate piglet. Mm -hmm. The idea is to increase the maternal antibody. So the maternal antibody will last longer and protect the piglet. Even with the best vaccine that we observe in the field, maternal antibodies are not present after five, six weeks of age. The, so the meaning of that is that in the last part of the nursery, the piglets will not be protected. So you say, okay, I will, it will cost more money, but I will vaccinate piglets. When are you going to vaccinate piglets? If you vaccinate piglets very young, there is a risk of interference with the maternal antibodies. So we demonstrate that if you vaccinate piglets at three and five weeks of age, then you have a response if the vaccine is good until the end of the nursery. Yeah, but the first part of the nursery, between four and six, seven weeks of age, animals will not be protected. So if the chicken of the egg problem, so if you vaccinate sows, the last part of the nursery will not be protected. If you vaccinate piglets, the first part of, 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 the, of the nursery will not be protected. So there is, there is a major problem. So far, the only tool we have are autosomal vaccine. And when people ask me, I recommend to use the, the autosomal vaccine. I recommend to evaluate the lab who is going to produce the vaccine, asking which type of adjuvant. We demonstrate that the same vaccine with two different adjuvants go to very good protection to not protection at all. The only difference is the adjuvant use. So, uh, and perhaps try to vaccinate sows. If this is not working, try to vaccinate piglets. But there is not really a real answer to that question. So we have a Two problems. The first problem is to find the vaccine that covers for all serotypes, but even with a very good vaccine, who are going to vaccinate? And that is a main problem, which was solved by the use of antibiotics as a preventive measure, but probably we will not be able to do that in the near future. So it's, it's a headache really to, to control the infections. <laughs> Absolutely. It does seem like a, a doom and gloom <laughs> story almost, right? Because so I, I was going to ask, I think I know what the answer to it is, but I'm like, you know, without without the vaccination, without the antibiotics, is there anything that we can do to to, to help this situation? Or the, be the best thing that you can do is to control or predisposing factor. That means to be an excellent uh, owner of a farm and say, okay, I will control peers' infection because the virus infection is a, the first predisposal factor for a strep suis. So if you have a herd which is unstable for peers, then you have uh, a, a farm that is highly susceptible to a strep suis. So you control co-infection, you reduce the stress of the animals. One, one of the things that happened, you, you are a nutritionist. Uh, 
if you take a look of the first pigs who die of strep suis in the nursery, I mean, the logical means it will be the, the pigs which are very weak or, you know, very small, very weak. It is the opposite. The nicest pigs, the piglets are very robust, are the first to drop. It seems to be an explanation. You as a nutritionist will probably tell me what do you think. <laughs> Is that the animals that are very robust and very heavy are drinking a lot of milk. And these are the animals who suffer the most when there is a transition to solid in the, in the nursery. And these animals are not eating sometimes for 24, 48 hours or 72 hours, are mm -hmm. eating much less because they are not well adapted. So you go from a very high consumption to very low consumption, which will cause a completely, uh, it's, it's, it's a mess in the intestine. And this is stressful for the animal, and it is thought, it has been proposed that it is one of the uh, one of the aspects that will disbalance the animal, induce a lot of stress, and perhaps help the animal to develop disease. Yeah, so, so like with most things, it comes back to the the management and making sure that you you know you you're taking good care. Absolutely, I mean. It, obviously, you have very high virulent strains that will cause problems anyway. But many of the cases, especially in North America, uh, many cases are caused sometimes for different serotypes in, in, in the same farm. Just to explain to you, a, diagnose, a diagnostic of a strep suisse infection is not so easy because Let's say that you have several animals that died. You send the animal to a necropsy and send samples to the laboratory. And okay, you isolate a strep suisse. We ask practitioner to ask to the lab to perform serotyping. My lab is the reference lab, and usually we perform the serotyping from all strains in Canada. So they send the strain to us for serotyping. And the result will give you the importance of a strep suisse. You have one situation where you have four animals that die and you have four different serotypes of a strep suisse. You isolate a strep suisse for all four animals. So you say strep suisse is my problem. But then you have four different serotypes. What is the meaning of that? That means that you have a lot of strep suisse in the tonsils and stress co-infection will influence the animal, so in one animal, one of the strains go, goes out from the tonsils and produce disease. In the other animal, is another one. In the other animal, is another one. That the meaning is, yes, the animals are dying for a strep suisse, but you don't have a very high on strain. Each strain that is there takes advantage of the situation, and yeah. the situation is co-infection, management, there are other problems. So when people came to me and say, listen, this is what I have, I will produce a vaccine, autogenous vaccine with five serotypes. We see that very often. An autogenous vaccine with five different strains in the same farm. My piece of advice is take care because yes, you have a strep suisse, but you have other problems. If you don't take care of the other problems, a vaccine with 10 different strains will not solve the problem because the next one, it will be another one that is not in the vaccine. Yeah. Then you have the other situation when you have four animals and sometimes the same serotype is present in the four animals. And you say you have a viral strain. Independently of the other factor, the presence of this viral strain is killing animal, is affecting animal anyway, independently of these factors. In that case, an autogenous vaccine can be tried to see if it may help the situation. Yeah, no, very, very interesting. Um, I, it, to me, that's a good place to go. I mean, we're coming to the, the end, I guess. 
you know, and I was going to ask about a take home message that you want to, to give to people. You might have just given it. I don't know. Maybe you have a different one that you want to. No, no, but uh, we can. We, no, no, but you are right. We can resume it. The first one is to perform a complete diagnosis. And to that, you need to send, we recommend three animals at least in three time, different times. That means you have a problem now with this batch of animals, send three deceased or, or dead animal to necropsy. And repeat that three times. And then if you have a strep suisse, you will have the serotypes and you will have Okay, you will be able to identify, I have a men's serotype causing 80% of the deaths. You know that you have a viral strain. So you know that perhaps you can go for an autogenous vaccine. If you do that, talk to the company, ask for the adjuvant, ask for a degree of success in previous vaccination, uh, ask yeah. a lot of questions. Uh, but at least you know that you have a viral strain. But if you do that and you have six different strains of a strep suisse, forget about an autogenous vaccine. The problem, strep suisse is the clinical, the symptomatology that you see of the problem, but not necessarily the origin of the problem. So you go back, do your homework, and try to uh, solve all the problems that uh, that can be present around the strep suisse infection. Yeah. What I mean is environment, presence of stress, co-infection, try to solve those problems and then see what is, what, what is the future. I mean, if you still have some problem, then you can go for diagnostic again, but do not try to fight against, you know, what is not the real cause of the disease. Yeah, I think that's a, a great message. You know, just as you were saying it, I think it also highlights the overall message of no matter what you have, the importance of knowing what you have, right? And not just for strep, but for for everything else too, to really then tailor the solution to your particular situation. You are right. And the second is, you know, I had, uh, I gave some courses this morning to a student of veterinary medicine, and uh, I was talking today about vaccination, vaccination in swine. And I was telling them that the best vaccine in the world will not solve a problem in a farm that had a lot of other problems. You know, you have, you know, you have a Let's say we not talk about strep suisse, we can, we can talk about any other pathogen. You know that you have a viral uh, a microorganism pathogen there, and you have a good vaccine for that. And some people came back to me and said, the vaccine is not working. When you begin to ask questions, they have a lot of problem of overpopulation. They have a problem of uh, sanitary conditions. They have a problem of nutrition. They have a So, you know, the immune system needs the, the, the condition to induce a good response. So the best vaccine in the world will never work if you do not have an appropriate environment for your pigs. So I guess this is for a strep suisse, but for any other infection, it's the same. Very good. It's time for our famous three. Uh, okay, well... So before I let you go, I gave you warning that we have our three questions <laughs> that we ask all of our, our our guests, right? So we'll start with one. Hopefully, it's uh, an, an easy one. You know, uh, your favorite uh, swine-related, or in this case, you know, it could be disease or or health-related resource that you kind of always go to and recommend. The answer will be probably funny for you, but my best resources are the good practitioners working in the field. I work mainly, uh, I mean, I man, uh, my, my expertise is mainly in the lab. I'm a veterinarian, but my, my expertise is mainly in the lab. So I need to talk to them, and I do that very often. I'm in contact with, because they are client, we, are, we have a, a diagnostic service here at the faculty, so... I have two labs in the diagnostic service for, for APP, actinobacillus pro pneumonia, for the strep suisse and glacerella para suisse. So I receive calls asking for, you know, explanation of the results from practitioner every day. 
but I learn more from them than they learn from me. Because uh, when you have a problem, we discuss together, but they came, okay, we, we, we can do that. I am going to try that. And then we talk again and say, yes, it's working. No, it's not working. So I, with my 35 years of experience, I learned that the people working in the field every day, they know a lot and we can exchange the information. And for me, they are a source of information that really exceptional. Believe it or not, people are cropping up more and more as a response to that answer that it's not necessarily a book and and you're not the first one that has said the people out there, right? So yeah, I, I think that's definitely a good one. It's like, you know, so many times it's big, it's picking up the phone and calling somebody, not trying to figure it out, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah, of course. Definitely. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay. So our, our next question then is a favorite book. This could be anything, right? So just a, a book that you'd recommend that our that our listeners look look into and read. You know, I um, I travel a lot. So I give conference and for expertise, I travel a lot around the world. So in Asia, in in Europe, and in the whole America, I really travel a lot. And a fascinating book, it's called The Culture Map. Uh, The author is Mayer, It's, it's a woman in fact, and it's incredible because what this person she is responsible to um, to form, you know, uh, managers of different of different uh, entreprises who are going to another country and trying to explain, you know, the culture is mm-hmm. comp- to to do business. In our case, to uh, to talk to farmers, producers, is completely different from one country to another. I mean, it's completely, completely different. Just to give you very 30 seconds, an example that I love, if there's a person who was in France and when she need to go to USA to have an important position in a company, so she went there trying to learn everything about the American way of working and stay there for six months. After six months, the author, Mayer, she went to meet with her in the USA to see how things were going. And she met first the uh, supervisor. And the supervisor said, it's not going well. In fact, we probably will give her one opportunity, but after that, we will have to let her go. Wow, that was really fast. Then she talked to the lady, and the lady said, it's perfect. Everything is going very, very well. I'm very happy, and they are very happy with me. And the explanation was the different culture between France and North America. <laughs> In North America, when you talk to a to a, to person uh, in the company, you will probably say, we are very happy, everything is going well. And then you say, but we have a problem. And that is the problem, you know, the sandwich way, a good one, the real <laughs> yeah. bad one, yeah. and another good one. So the message for her, it was, everything in general was okay. In France, the first thing to be said is, you are doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that, that you, it's a very nice book because you learn the different culture that can be can change everything, the way of communication. Well, I'm definitely going to have to look that one up because obviously as somebody who has grad students that come from all over the world, you know, obviously it's really, yeah. yeah. Okay, very, very good. Um, so our final question, you know, is when you look back at, uh, we, we say swine professionals, but you can extend this. I like to extend it to kind of any kind of leader, you know, that's come across is um, an ask, uh, um, a personality trait or, or, or something that they do, you know, that you find makes the ones that are successful, like what, what is it that, that it leads to their success? To me, it's work, work, and work. <laughs> I, mean, to, I mean, it's what I learned is you need to be a really hard worker. Obviously, there are a lot of other things. 
but you really need to be a hard worker. And if something is not okay for you, you need to work on that and say why it's not, it's not okay for you. The other thing is to recognize mistakes. I mean, we learn from mistakes. The first thing I told you is the mistake I did <laughs> when they interviewed me. I said, nah, that's probably not strep suicide, and it was. And I was a specialist. <laughs> and, you know, and it's okay because you learn from your mistakes. So don't be afraid. To, uh, to, to have mistakes, but you need to work, work, and work. That would be my message. No, great. Uh, well, Marcelo, I, I hope you enjoyed your time on here. I think we, we gave a lot of good information. Uh, I found it very interesting. So uh, thank you again for, for coming on, and, and hopefully, you know, maybe we'll have you on again in the future uh, when you have some, some more information for us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation.